The Iliad by Homer. Adapted and read to you by George Weedman with music and sound effects from Epidemic Sound. Book two. In the ninth year of the Trojan War, neither side is winning. The conflict is locked in a stalemate. The Trojans are trapped in their walls. The Achaeans are trapped with each other. Infighting and plague are taking more lives than combat. Achilles, the best warrior of the Achaeans, has deserted alongside his men, and the supreme god Zeus has decided to favor the Trojans instead. Now when all gods and lords of men slept, sweet sleep could not take hold of Zeus. In his mind he pondered on how best to do honor for Achilles, and destroy a multitude of Achaeans backed up against their own ships. And he picked the plan he thought was the best, to send a ruinous, lying dream to Atreus' son Agamemnon, and he called out and addressed the dream in winged words. You will be deluding him, dream. Go to the tent of Agamemnon and say these words exactly as I say them to you. Tell him to order the Achaeans to take up arms. Now is his chance to take Troy. The gods are no longer divided in council, for my wife Hera has convinced us all to bring woe to the Trojans and curse their men with defeat. So he spoke and Dream heard and descended quickly down to the ships of the Achaeans, where Agamemnon was wrapped in a divine slumber. And Dream hovered above his head, taking the likeness of Nestor, son of Neleus, the elder whose counsel Agamemnon prized above all his other lords. Oh, you, with all your monarch's cares oppressed, of sleep you shouldn't indulge like the rest. Ill-fitting for a chief who so wisely guides, directs in council and war presides. It's you to whom their safety the people owes, but to waste your long nights in indolent repose? Glorious king, listen, counsel from Zeus I bear. Thou and thy people now claim his heavenly care. In just array, draw forth your battle train, Order your men to take arms to the Trojan plain. Now is your chance. Charge forth and destroy the lofty towers of wide-walled Troy. The gods are no longer divided in council. Hera has convinced them in her way most spousal. Awake, Agamemnon, but don't you forget, the Trojans' doom is soon to be on set. And thus Dream spoke, the words flowing around them with their soft, soothing lies. He thought he would take King Priam's citadel of Troy on that very day. The fool! Little did he know what was in the mind of Zeus, who had far more plans in store for both the Chians and Trojans. He awoke, the Dream's words still flowing around him. He put on his soft, comfortable tunic and heavy cloak. He bound his splendid sandals above his comely feet and slung about his shoulders a silver-studded sword. He took up his ancient, ancestral, imperishable scepter and sallied forth to the ships of the Achaeans. The goddess of dawn stepped up to the foothills of Olympus, heralding the light of day to all of the gods and mortals. And Agamemnon sent his clear-voiced heralds to call an assembly, and so they summoned with haste. But first he gathered the lords and princes and elders in particular, those privileged to hear his more private strategies. They met next to the ship of Nestor, king of Pylos, and when they were all assembled he laid out his plans. My friends, he said, As I slept, I had a dream sent from Zeus of the heavens. The dream hovered above my bed, and in the figure of our Nestor here, it said, Glorious king, listen, counsel from Zeus I bear, thou and thy people now claim his heavenly care. Order the Achaeans to take arms to Troy. Your chance is now, go forth, destroy. The gods are no longer divided in council, Hera's convinced them of her will. Then the dream vanished, and I awoke he said, waving the scepter to and fro to the point of his argument. But even upon hearing Zeus's divine instructions, Agamemnon still believed his own plans to be wiser. Come now, let us arm the sons of the Achaeans and prepare for battle. But first, I have a proposal. We shall test our men's loyalty and morale. I will tell them the war is lost to fly home with their ships, but you lords, princes, and elders, prevent this. Restrain them. I have no doubts in the hearts of my men, he said, and sat down again. And there stood up among them Nestor, king of Pylos, who carefully spoke with intentions of goodwill. 
My friends, he said, princes and lords of the Argives, if any other man of the Achaeans told us of this dream, we would have deemed them delusional and rejected their counsel. But he who said it claims to be the highest of all Achaeans. Come now, let us get to arming and preparing our people. With this being said, he led the sceptered king's princes and elders out from their tent of assembly. They all rose with him in obedience to Agamemnon. The rest of the soldiers pressed in near the tent trying to hear. They swarmed like bees that buzz densely, sizzling and streaming from cracks of rocks, clustering like grapes, clustering in mass onto spring flowers. One hundred thousand men pouring out from their ships and tents, ranging themselves onto the shore. And with them, urging them on, ran Rumor, messenger of Zeus, joining together for a mad, disorderly confusion. It took nine shouting heralds to control this crowd, to calm their tumult and bid them listen to the lords of men, and King Agamemnon rose, holding his scepter. The scepter that Hephaestus had toiled so hard to make, Hephaestus gave it to Zeus, the son of Kronos. Zeus gave it to Hermes, son of Zeus. Hermes gave it to Pelops, son of Tantalus. Pelops gave it to Atreus, son of Pelops. Atreus, dying, gave it to Thyestes, son of Pelops. And Thyestes left the scepter to Agamemnon, son of Atreus, to carry and lord over the Argives and the many, many islands. And leaning on this scepter, he now spoke. My friends, he said, Danaean heroes, sons of Ares, Great Zeus, son of Kronos, has played me for a fool and lied to me. Long ago, he promised we should sack the city of Troy and return home safely, but we see now that he has punished me for leading to the losses of so many men over these nine years. A shameful thing for future generations to remember that such a strong, vast Achaean army waged such a war for no purpose. We outnumber the Trojans by such a high count that, if we divided our men into groups of ten, with each group capturing their own Trojan to pour them their wine, then many of those groups would lack for a wine pourer. Achaeans, let it be known that we outnumber them immensely, but the Trojans have allies resupplying them from the river Scamander, which flows beside the city from the lakes of inland Lycia and we believe they are using clever tunnel work to reach this river, bringing in more food and men than we can match ourselves, keeping us from starving them out or depleting their reserves. Furthermore, our ships are rotting from nine years of wear, their cables no longer hold sound, our wives and children are growing old and lonely without us, and the work we came here to do has not been done. Now come, do as I say and be persuaded by it. Let us go home with our ships, for we will never take Troy. So spoke the lord of men Agamemnon, anxiously awaiting the clamoring crowd's answer. In contradiction of his own spirit, he roused the spirits of all the men, none of whom heard the assembly of lords in the din. The assembly was shaken by the throng, like the waves of the Icarian deep sea, when the eastern and southern winds break from heaven's clouds to rush the sea hither and thither, or like when the western wind sweeps over a field of grain and the ears bow beneath the blast, so the crowd swayed with loud cries as they ran towards the ships. They cheered each other on as they embarked and drew the vessels out to sea, shoveling out channels of sand beneath the hulls, taking away the stays and dragging them down into the foam their voices soaring up to the heavens, so eager were they to return home. And then, beyond all the fates, they would have returned home, were it not for the ox-eyed goddess Hera hearing their voices. And so she said to grey-eyed Athena, For shame! Look, Athena, daughter of Zeus of the Aegis, look at this! Is this how the Argives will be returning across the broad-backed sea to their beloved fatherland, leaving behind King Priam and Princess Helen, of whom so many of them have died so far from their native soil? Athena, go through the host of these bronze-clad men and tell them. Check their impulsiveness with your calming words. Do not let them drag their ships any further. Without hesitating, the goddess grey-eyed Athena obeyed and went on her way, darting down from the peaks of Olympus, soon appearing next to brilliant Odysseus, equal to Zeus in cleverness and counsel. 
Standing still next to his black-benched vessel, he grimaced, his heart filling with disappointment. Athena approached behind him and spoke in his ear. Will it be thus, divine Laertes' son? Thus the Achaeans will flee, without honor they run? Thus their own country will bear their disgrace, giving fame eternal to Troy's lasting race. Shall captive Helen remain unfreed, unrevenged for whom a thousand sons bleed? Take haste, king of Ithaca, prevent this shame, recall the armies and their chiefs reclaim, your own genius of eloquence employ, trust us immortals to the fall of Troy. Odysseus knew from her voice that it was the voice of a goddess, and up he left, throwing off his cloak and running straight to Atreus' son Agamemnon, grasping quickly his family's imperishable scepter. With this, he ran about among the ships of the Achaeans, seeking out kings and chieftains to stand by them fairly and say, <sighs> Sir, this flight of yours is cowardly and unworthy for someone of your station of excellence, and I do believe it's not just me who believes so. Listen... Agamemnon is testing us, and if we fail that test, he will come down here, and he will come down hard. Now, we didn't all get to hear what he said in there, but I wouldn't put it past that brute to act violently, unlike yourself. Remember, us kings are too proud. It's like how they always used to say, we have the hand of Zeus propping us up. But when Odysseus came across some shouting commoner of the ranks, he'd thrash them with the scepter and assault them with no thanks. <sighs> Quit! Acting like madmen and listen to your superiors. They're better men than you shivering ladies hiding under these holes like strengthless whelks. Come on. There's no way you think you can all be kings. And by the way, you are angering way higher authorities than just me and the other lords. Remember this scepter? I'm telling you, this scepter comes down from Zeus. So masterfully did Odysseus command the fleeing men who hurried back to the camp to form an assembly. So great was their number that they became as loud as thunder, as loud as the surf when it comes crashing down upon the shore, the whole sea erupting in an uproar. And once the soldiers had finally sat down and become orderly, there was still shouting one man, Thersites of the endless speech, he who knew a very many words but never how to order them, a monger of sedition, a railer against authority. He cared more to make the Achaeans laugh than to avoid bitterness with the princes. He was the ugliest man of all the Achaeans who came to Troy, lame in both legs and lame in one foot, his two shoulders rounded in a hunch over his chest, his head misshapen into a point, and sparse was the hair growing on it. He hated Achilles and Odysseus most of all, frequent targets for his verbal abuse, but now it was Agamemnon who he directed his hatred, speaking his shrill voice with his serpent speech in a poorly memorized mimicking of Achilles' grievances. Agamemnon, he cried, what ails you now and what more do you want? You're already gluttonous with plundered treasure. Whenever we take a town, you get the first spoils, and yet you still lack for gold and women. Worse for them to be brought into such misery by a wine-sacked weakling and coward. We'll all sail home and see if we are truly needed. Achilles is a much better man than Agamemnon, and look how he got treated. Achilles took it meekly and showed no fight, for if he did... If it weren't for this, this would be your last outrage. Thus railed Thersites, but Odysseus ran up quickly and rebuked him with strong words. Thersites, as gifted an orator as you think you are, you need to shut up. Now it is a foolish man's endeavor to challenge princes when none of them are on your side. I swear there is no more worthless soldier in this whole camp than you. Drop this business about the kings and shut your mouth or go home. We don't yet know how these things are going to turn out. Lord Agamemnon, son of Atreus, gets the lion's share because he is the one organizing and compensating and feeding all these armies. He is the king of kings for this expedition. If I catch you trying again to stage this little mutiny, I swear, I swear, you are going to make me chop my own head off right here, right now. 
At this outburst, he dashed the scepter between Thersites' shoulders, a big bloody welt raised on his back, and he sat down, looking foolish with tears in his eyes. The soldiers were distressed, but they still couldn't help from laughing, and Odysseus listened to one of their voices among the crowd. <laughs> Look at that. That is the best thing Odysseus has done us this whole war, to stop that slanderous mouth from prattling on and on. Last thing we need is for a ruckus to descend into a mutiny. Well, if the kings are feeling safe, then I'm feeling safe. So spoke the common soldiers, and above them stood silver-tongued Odysseus, holding up the scepter with gray-eyed goddess Athena by his side, taking the likeness of a herald who bade the people to be silent. He thus addressed them with all sincerity and goodwill. King Agamemnon, son of Atreus, shepherd of the people, the Achaeans here seem minded to make you the most blameworthy of all mortal men. I think they've forgotten the promise they made on their way here from Argos, which is, by the way, excellent horse pasturing land, that we should not return until you have sacked the city of Troy. I hear them wailing like women and children do about returning back to their homes, but I don't think they have the cognitive capacity to predict how much worse it would be if they returned home sick at heart, with nothing to show for this whole miserable trip. Now I do empathize with the common soldier. Just one month is too long to be parted from hearth and home, out in some strange foreign land getting blasted by the winter winds. This is the ninth year that's circled above the earth since we set sail. No, I don't blame them one bit. But it is more shameful to go home empty-handed. So we must endure, my friends. Be a little more patient. And soon we'll learn whether or not one of those prophecies Calchas had over there will come true. Me? Yes! Uh, that's that right! One? Don't you remember? We saw a portent! A sign from the gods! <laughs> and I do believe my brothers among the lords over there will corroborate our collective memories of that prodigious occasion, am I right? Right. Now, there was a moment we all recall well, every one of you, when it seemed only yesterday when the Achaean fleet was first setting sail from Aulis. We were setting up on sacred altars a perfect sacrifice in a peaceful spring grove with a beautiful plane tree. When there appeared the sign from the gods, a serpent sent from Zeus himself, hideous, dark stained with blotches of blood red coloring, and it darted straight up that hill into the tree. And there, there was a sparrow, a nest full of young sparrows, eight poor little birds sticking their heads up above their nest. And with their mother sparrow, they made nine sparrows total. The serpent darted up the tree and ate the poor little cheeping birds. Oh, it was terrible, the mother flapping her wings helplessly until the serpent coiled itself around her too and got her in the wing. She was screaming, the hatchlings cheeping their poor pitying cries. And then when the snake finished eating, the god Zeus who sent him up there turned him into a stone. And we stood there, wondering at that point what all this meant when Calchas realized since this happened, while we were performing a sacrifice, that he, a true gifted prophet, made his prophetic prognostication. That because the serpent consumed eight sparrows, nine sparrows in total, so shall we fight for nine years at Troy and take it on the tenth. It's coming true, it's all coming true. Stay here and fight men till we take the city of Troy. So he spoke and a great roar erupted among the Argives, their pounding shouts echoing against the holes of the ships, until Nestor, the Geranian horseman, spoke up. Oh, for shame, you are all such children sitting around here talking, when we should be fighting. What's to become of all those covenants and sacred oaths and prophetic signs? Are we just going to throw all those away and go back? No! All this time we've exchanged words is time wasted. We still haven't assembled our troops into formation and begun the march. Come on, Agamemnon, son of Atreus. Be these men's leader and form them up. Leave the cowards and the plotters to perish. Their work will come to nothing. They'll never know if these prophecies will come true. For I saw Zeus himself nod in approval as we sailed forth from Aulis nine years ago. He flashed his lightning on our right-hand flank, showing us his favor. 
So let no man here be hasty to return home until he has kidnapped some Trojan wife in revenge for the queen they took from us. Any one of you think of cowering and deserting, go and try. As soon as you touch your ship thinking of home, we'll all watch how fast you die. Now, Agamemnon, plan well and follow more of my wisdom. Organize your men by clan and by tribe. People always yearn to follow their own kin, whether in either cowardice or bravery. That way we'll know whether our victory or defeat came from the gods or from your troops' own skill and valor. Once more, old sir, you have outdone all the other Achaeans in speech. If I had ten more of you, King Prime City would have been sacked long ago. But Zeus of the Aegis, he has brought me many troubles. First that business with Achilles, and then the cowardice shown by many of you this morning. But if we will be of one mind soon, then Troy will fall before this night. Now go eat your morning meals, sharpen your spears, and fit well your shield straps. Feed your horses and inspect the joints and nails of your chariots. We'll be fighting all day without rest until we are weary and the Trojans are dead. Any of you I see retreating to shiver back at the ships will become prey for the dogs and birds. So he declared, and the Achaeans roared in applause, as when the waves are stirred by the southern gale winds, and break onto the rocky highlands, and dash against it again and again without ceasing, every wave coming at it from all quarters. So too did the Achaeans dash throughout the shelters of their camp, building fires and setting their morning meals, and burning too the sacrifices offered to their gods, each man praying that they would live through the upcoming battle. Agamemnon, king of men, sacrificed a five-year-old ox to Kronos' almighty son Zeus, and he summoned the elders. First came Nestor, then King Adominaeus, then the two Ajaxes and the son of Tydeus. Then came Odysseus, equal to Zeus in council, and last Menelaus, son of Atreus, who came without summon, for he knew his brother needed him in his laboring busyness. They stood around the ox and held up handfuls of oats, and in prayer Lord Agamemnon spoke. Zeus whose thunder fixed thy throne, supreme of gods unbound alone, hear me now before the sun descends, before the night's dark veil extends. Lower into dirt the Trojan spires, grind them to ash with the Chian fire. Into Hector's chest thrust my shining sword, his slaughtered men groaning for their lord. They pulled back the victims' heads, slaughtering and flaying them. And although Zeus heard all of it and accepted the sacrifice, he refused to grant any of it. Even as they cut away the meat from the thigh bone, wrapping it in fat, making a double fold, layering shreds of meat on top of meat, even as they spitted these and roasted them over dried split wood, and tasted the vital organs and cut them into pieces, piercing them and spitting them over fire, Zeus was still refusing them their prayers. When the sacrifice was done and they feasted and ate well, no man's hunger was denied a fair portion. After their desire for eating and drinking had been satisfied, Nestor, the Geranian horseman, spoke up. Glorious son of Atreus, highest of all men, King Lord Agamemnon, let's waste no more time talking or tarrying. Let the heralds summon our men and all their bronze, gather them ship by ship and take roll, so that they all will be swifter to bring about fearsome war. So he spoke, and Agamemnon sent out heralds and criers to all the chiefs to gather up all the Achaean tribes and clans. And as they ran, Athena ran alongside them, holding her timeless immortal aegis, dangling a hundred tassels of pure gold, each one worth the price of a hundred oxen. She sprinted furiously everywhere among the Achaeans, urging them forth and putting courage in their hearts, so that they may fight all day without rest. She sprinted furiously everywhere among the Achaeans, urging them forth and putting courage in their hearts, so that they may fight well all day without rest. It was in this way that war became sweeter in their eyes, sweeter even than returning home on their ships. 
as when a great forest fire rages on a mountain, and its horrible glow can be seen from so distant afar, so too did the gleam from their bronze armor flash all the way up to the firmament of heaven. As when flocks of geese and cranes and swans wing throughout the winds above the waters of the Caister River, crying as they settle into marshes alive with their screaming, so too did the tribes and clans pour out from their ships onto the plains of the Scamander River, the grounds ringing alive with brass under men and horses. They stood side by side as thick as the flower-spangled fields that bloom in summer, as do countless swarms of flies buzz around the pails of milk found in a herdsman's home in springtime, so too did the Achaeans swarm onto the plain in hopes for Trojan destruction. And as easily as the goat herds gather up their scattered herd, and as proud as one steer will stand out among the cattle, so too did the Achaean chiefs wave through the multitudes of men, and so too did Agamemnon stand preeminent out among the heroes, with a chest like that of Poseidon and a girth like that of Ares. Sing to me now, O muses who have your homes on Olympus, for you are all-knowing and eternal and remember all things. Sing to us men who know no thing for certain, we who can only know rumors and hearsay and song. Sing to me of the leaders and princes of the Danaeans. No feat of memory could ever repeat nor name the hundred thousand strong, not even if to one's memory ten tongues sang along. Sing to me, daughters of the Aegis. Sing to me of the commanders, and to them how many numbers belong. Out from Boeotia sent fifty black ships, Peneleus and Letus and Prothenor's men's gripped. From Etion's hills and Aulus's rich fields, one hundred twenty men they did yield. Forty tall ships, the Phokian sent to tide, one hundred men clinging fast to the side. Fierce Ajax led all the Locrians on, with Ajax the lesser, Oelius' son, skilled to direct their throwing spears aright, swift in pursuit and active to the flight. Fifty ships from Athens stemmed the main, led by Menestheus through the liquid plain. Athens the fair, where Theseus reigned, under them Salaminian men came to aid. Ninety ships sail from Pelos' coast, countless men under Nestor the oldest host. On sixty sails the Arcadian bands unite, under Aphrodite's chosen man, Agapenor's sight, the bold Asterians and Arminian bands from forty swift ships Eurypelos commands. And with vengeance from cliff-scoured Laconia warned the Spartans with their black bloody broth, sailing aboard sixty hollow ships under command of shameful King Menelaus, punished by strife and discord, his queen kidnapped and him chasing after. In front of him sailed silent King Agamemnon, King of Mycenae, Cleone, Corinth, and many others, his heart hardening with grief, having just sacrificed his own daughter to the gods who would not draft wind for his one hundred beat ships. Twelve ships from Ithaca following the shores, Odysseus the king beneath pulling at the oars. But his lying tongue still couldn't fool the gods, his heart yearns for home, and even for his dogs. Then there was the Polemos, son of Heracles, heading nine swift vessels through the angry foamy seas. When to his manly years this child did grew, by accident or murder his own uncle he did slew. Next out to war was the generous Argive train from Aegina, Asina, and Hermione's wild plain. Sailed eighty ships under the firmament's high sky with Stenelos, Eurylos, and Diomedes' war cry. And then at last there was swift-footed godlike Achilles of the Myrmidons, sailing fifty black ships over the raging waves of the wine-dark sea. King of Bahia, the Pelasgian Argives, the Elopians and Elosians. But as he heard the men marching, he did not join. To their grievous cacophony he gave no thought, stewing in his rage over the unfulfilled promise, prophesied for excellence in exchange for his young death. 
prophesied for his accursed, stolen excellence. Thank you for listening to Book Two of the Iliad, where we get a glimpse at Homer's imagining of Mycenaean politics as well as Mycenaean psychology. But how would he have known about these things? The Trojan War supposedly happened four to five hundred years before Homer's time, and Homer's individual personal authorship itself is up for debate as well, a matter that has been known as the Homeric question, which is really about four different questions. Did Homer actually exist? Did the Trojan War actually happen? When and where are the Iliad and the Odyssey supposed to be taking place? And what could have possibly been his historical sources for an oral society in a time before writing? About three of those four questions actually have surprisingly convincing answers nowadays. But the truth behind Homer's existence and authorship is the fourth outlier. That one is still up for grabs. But to start on one of the simpler answers of when and where exactly the Iliad is supposed to take place, I appreciate the brevity of Bernard Knox's quote in the introduction of the 1990 print version of Robert Fagel's translation. It is an Iron Age poem about a Bronze Age event. That's it. Ancient historians and modern archaeological evidence peg the Trojan War at roughly around 1200 BC. As the late Professor Donald Kagan said, when we're going this far back into prehistory, precision is impossible. Don't worry about it. This puts it towards the very end of the Greek Bronze Age, whereas if Homer actually existed, then, according to the ancient historians and to no modern corroborating evidence, he supposedly lived in the Greek Iron Age, 800s or 700s BC. But to get a clearer picture of the frame Homer was looking at his history through, and the questions of the political system that his audience would have been trying to piece together as they listened to him, it's a good idea to add another age label onto those two periods. The period transitioning the Bronze Age into the Iron Age is the Greek Dark Ages, representing the collapse of the Mycenaean system and the following anarchy before eventually leading into the establishment of the city-state polis system, where written records begin to pop up again. Those records are supported by a contemporary to Homer. He is not the only surviving poet from his own time. There is another one named Hesiod who isn't remembered as well and wrote quite different poetry. Hesiod was writing about the more grounded trials and tribulations of farming and laboring and suffering in the drudgery of their current Iron Age, whereas Homer was writing about these nostalgic, heroic, exciting adventures of men who were bigger, stronger, and apparently living better than what his audience was used to. They characterized the Bronze Age as being more glorious than their own, and the version of the Bronze Age that both poems are describing is one whose system of aristocratic royal rule would simply not work in the Iron Age systems described by Hesiod. Like I said in the last chapter, Mycenaean Greece was quite different from our typical vision of classical ancient Greece. With its 1,000 plus competing city-states who were fervently interfighting with each other, each one yearning for its own sovereignty and independence. The ancient Greece that had famously overpowered military units of phalanxes and Spartans operating on an infamously underpowered political regional system that only had brief glimpses of uniting together only when they were forced to by foreign invaders. When ancient Greek colonists sailed away to found new settlements, they were establishing new independent city-states. The colonialism going on back then would never be an extension of a mainland power. The city-states yearning so insistently towards their own sovereignty may well have come out of memories of the Mycenaean system and its tyrannical kings collapsing, a system where the Greek world tried and ultimately failed to emulate the top-down totalitarian empires of absolute hereditary monarchs seen in the most powerful Bronze Age empires, such as Egypt and the Babylonian empires of Mesopotamia. And so, a lot of the question over whether or not Homer was one person comes from noticing a stark difference in setting between the Iliad and the Odyssey. 
They both are supposed to take place in the same historical era following the same generation of characters, but they're written as if one poem is grounded more from memories of the Bronze Age and the other from memories of the Dark Age. The Iliad features a politically complex, highly developed, urbanized Aegean world, where big armies are able to organize and unite under a common cause, armored in the more expensive material of bronze, which required tin and copper gathered from almost opposite ends of the Mediterranean. Whereas much of the Odyssey has our hero wearing rags, if nothing at all, and when he's not exploring uncharted islands inhabited by small handfuls of weird supernatural creatures, he's negotiating for safe travel out of the kingdom of Phaeacia, a kingdom described as being isolated from the rest of the world and peaceful in its ignorance of outside politics. The Iliad, by comparison, mentions an active network of traders who are able to safely travel in and out of the poem's war zone and earn a profit from supplying both sides. Unlike the Odyssey, characters in the Iliad never go wanting for food and water. Also unlike the Odyssey's plot, centered around Odysseus' kingdom suffering a violent succession crisis, the Iliad is much more insistent in its rulers having a divine right to exercise their authority. The earliest surviving law code we still have a hold of today is from one of those Bronze Age Babylonian empires that the Mycenaeans were trying and failing to emulate. 500 years before the Trojan War, the Code of Hammurabi was written, beginning with the claim that, to drastically paraphrase his quote, when Anu the Sublime, Lord of Heaven and Earth, decreed the fate of the land, they called by name me, Hammurabi, to bring about the rule of righteousness over the land. Before reading down his incredibly long list of rules and laws that get so specific that you can only imagine what sort of weird trouble his people were getting up to. Hammurabi's claim to have a divine right to rule is something that never fizzled away from Western history. It goes from Hammurabi to the Old Testament God picking his prophets and preferred monarchs to St. Augustine's theological justification behind why so many in the Roman Empire decided to convert to Christianity to Charlemagne partitioning up medieval Europe into a system of priests and bishops and kings and governors to the United States Declaration of Independence invoking the concept Concept by claiming that a self-evident creator had given all men equal and inalienable rights. The Enlightenment-era deists who authored that version of the concept were not so cosmologically arrogant as to claim they knew exactly how it happened and exactly which creator was the one that gave them this, but the concept nevertheless remained, and likely will continue to remain so long as powerful people in our universe are going to be dictating the lives and deaths of less powerful people in the universe, they're probably going to claim that a higher power in the universe gave them permission to do so. And in Book 2 of the Iliad, we see that Agamemnon's authority is grounded on the same logic, and that it nearly collapses from his own overconfidence. What ultimately legitimizes the authority of Agamemnon is whether or not the common soldiers believe Zeus is on his side, and Homer's omnipotent narration takes us through a deliciously ironic sequence of Zeus changing his mind, turning against Agamemnon, while Agamemnon himself comes to believe harder than ever that Zeus is on his side. However, his soldiers quickly come to doubt their leader's divine authority, and Odysseus and Nestor save the day by convincing them all over again that, yes, Zeus really is on Agamemnon's side. And the irony of the storytelling in Homer's greater plot cannot go ignored. While the line-to-line -line language applauds the totalitarian authority of these kings and their increasingly grander epithets, Homer's gods are ultimately more fickle than what the kings are claiming and thus so is their authority to rule. The Trojan War is one that neither side truly wins. Remember that the Achaeans never really win this war in a fair honorable fight. They ultimately have to resort to trickery and deception to get inside the walls. Troy is destroyed and leveled to the ground and wiped off the map, yes, but every Achaean war criminal on the way there eventually gets their own just desserts shortly afterwards. In other lost stories from the Trojan War mythos that are only known to summary to us, but were well known as common background knowledge to the original audience. The tragedy of the Trojan War may well have been inspired by memories of how the power and might of the warlike Mycenaeans ultimately collapsed shortly after the dating of the Trojan War. 
The Iliad is a snapshot of that period in history where almost all the mighty Bronze Age totalitarian empires collapsed, a period known, quite uncreatively, as the Late Bronze Age Collapse. Exactly why this collapse happened is still not ubiquitously agreed upon. The secrets of agriculture, urbanization, and metalworking were spreading out to the less urbanized people outside the empires who already had an axe to grind against them, while around the same time, climate change factors were triggering droughts and crop failures inside the empires. The final trigger to the process totally was a series of foreign invaders tearing down walls and burning down buildings, but what's still up for debate is the series of events that eventually allowed those foreign invaders to succeed, whereas in previous centuries they wouldn't have. In the Iron Ages, Egypt was the only major Bronze Age empire left with its Bronze Age continuity still intact, and it was greatly weakened at that. The Mycenaean Greece political system, on the other hand, completely collapsed, and the Greek world still had about five centuries of recovery time to go through before a new system replaced the old. This is why, in the Odyssey, for example, we eventually encounter a character who is labeled as Odysseus's swineherd later in the story. After his miserable journey home, there are few subjects of his old kingdom who are still loyal to him, and his old swineherd is described with the language as Odysseus's swineherd. Not a local swineherd or the local swineherd, he is Odysseus's in particular swineherd. Keep these ironies in mind when your more modern concepts of political theory crash against these Homeric ethods that seem to value loyalty to totalitarian kings as a kind of admirable kind of virtue, and how this does seem to contradict Homer's own belittlement and punishments of the kings he's singing about. He is playing to the sensibilities of his own audiences, who had the oral historical memories passed down of a more stable Bronze Age period from centuries earlier, with its bigger, stronger and more commandeering kings, but the more present world that the audience was more familiar with was one of more fragmented authorities. Compared to the Bronze Age, the relative lack of extreme, unquestioning loyalty going on during the Iron Age was implicitly allowing the artistic freedom for Homer to tell stories of their predecessor kings occasionally being foolish and wrong. But what Homer could have never possibly predicted is that normalizing that imagery of kings infighting and arguing just as foolishly as the rest of us do would eventually butterfly effect its way into ancient Greece stumbling across democracy. Not to say that all the debate and strife seen in Homer was predicting that democracy would happen centuries later, so much as that Homer's depictions reflect a moment in time that sheds light on how that transition happened. The Mycenaean kings may have been trying to emulate the totalitarian rule of Egypt and Mesopotamia, but they never got farther than having totalitarian rule over pretty small territories of pretty small populations. Egypt and Mesopotamia are vast floodplains of flat land, whereas Greece is more like an island nation with a mainland that's covered in rugged mountains. The ancient authorities couldn't exactly efficiently police across so many natural obstacles, and the collapse of these totalitarian but petty rulers eventually led to the oligarchical system seen in Homer's day, where there never was just one king ruling over a city-state. The closest analog was a system of tolerated tyranny, where tyrant kings were tolerated for short periods because of a socially approving attitude towards uprising and revolutions that was equally tolerated. Tyranny was not yet considered a bad word. The tyrants were under enormous pressure to rule benevolently, and if they didn't, they'd rarely last more than a couple decades to cement a more permanent dynasty. If they weren't being ruled by an always brief period of tyranny, some city-states would be ruled by two kings, some city-states had four kings, and many city-states weren't operated by kings at all, but rather by the rich. They were oligarchies, with a council of 200 to 400 of the wealthiest citizens voting on their laws. That kind of oligarchy is more often the rule, the default style of government for an ancient Greek city-state. One city-state in particular, Athens, was ruled by a council of 500, before it was overthrown by a benevolent tyrant, before that tyrant was overthrown by a much worse draconian tyrant, before Dracon himself was overthrown by a populist rebellion, before that was overthrown by another tyrant, before that tyrant was overthrown by another populist uprising that finally settled on compromising policies that are now known as democracy. 
The creation of democracy in Athens was not inevitable, nor natural, nor cleanly explainable. It hardly gives the impression that a divine creator was planning things all along, and it's actually quite a hilarious series of slapstick coincidences that you'll have a lot of fun learning about if you ever read Herodotus. But to get back to the point, the chain of events here does have, as one of its strongest links, those memories of infighting kings that we see in the Iliad. A link that is so strong because of just how seriously the ancient Greeks took the Iliad as a real history of their real evolution of statecraft. In the Robert Muller introduction heard in the audible audiobook version of the Fagel's translation, quote, The Homeric epics incidentally contain the seeds of democratic government, as in the popular assembly. The nobles are not aloof from the common life and have no fancy gentility. In war, they lead their men in a common action. In peace, join them in manual labor. As W.P. Kerr observed, Sir Lancelot was horribly distressed when he had to ride in a cart. But in a similar situation, Odysseus was not at all embarrassed. He had no doubt built a cart with his own hands. Quote, This is why I included the line of him pulling the oars in his ship alongside all his other men. In Book 2 in the Iliad, Greece is operating under what the late Donald Kagan called a heroic system, where the king's right to rule was supposedly legitimized by their soldiers witnessing him performing heroic feats on the battlefield. And if you'll remember from Book 1, Achilles tells us that Agamemnon has not yet been witnessed fighting in battle. After Agamemnon is given this dream that misleads him into testing his soldiers' loyalty, he tells them that the war is lost and it's time to go home. And he expects his soldiers to say, No, king, no, we insist that we'll stay. We'll get him eventually. To Agamemnon's surprise, and to the audience's comedic sensibilities, his soldiers do the exact opposite. It's a joke that would definitely not have been a joke if it was written under Agamemnon's own time. It takes quite a few centuries of swinging historical cycles to develop the sarcasm and critical perspective needed to appreciate the ingenious layers of psychological irony going on here. It absolutely makes sense that the dream appears in the form of Nestor, the one person whom Agamemnon is not so prideful as to dismiss. It makes sense that the dream is offering Agamemnon what he most desires in his desperate circumstances, to defeat the Trojans as soon as possible with Without needing Achilles' help at all. It makes sense that the dream flatters his wisdom and beneficence before giving him the false advice, and then Homer employs some downright Shakespearean use of ironic language to tell this joke. A joke that might go totally ignored if you're not looking at a computer screen full of different translations, all taking aim at the same single line. It's when he says, Danaean heroes, sons of Ares, great Zeus, son of Kronos, has played me for a fool and lied to me. This is such brilliant writing. Because he's right. Zeus has lied to him, just not in the way Agamemnon thinks, because Agamemnon thinks he's telling a lie. And in order for Agamemnon to tell his lie to his soldiers, he has to arrange his words in a way that accidentally tells them the truth. That Zeus really did actually lie to him. And the soldiers end up accidentally believing the lie because of what is actually the truth, because Agamemnon is so bad at lying. It is brilliant! This one line is one of the more gleaming examples of just how many centuries, if not millennia, ahead of his time Homer was. Homer's use of irony and the depth of characterization going on here is so far ahead of the contemporaries that it is occasionally paralyzing. It is so good, you could start a religion with this stuff. Which also plunges us into the storytelling mechanisms of how the Greek gods are not just elemental creatures representing the unexplained forces of nature, but also the unexplained forces of human psychology. In the Iliad, the Olympian gods are absolutely real entities whose existence is never in doubt, but in the later books you'll hear lines where Homer will specifically clarify that Zeus or Ares or Athena are all off somewhere else very distracted taking care of other businesses, while at the same time the human characters down on Earth will suddenly have Zeus put the inescapable fear into them, or have Ares cloud their mind with bitter rage, or they'll get suddenly stricken with an elaborately wise plan sent from Athena, or some other such extreme emotional state. To once again call on Robert Muller's audible introduction, quote, 
It may be helpful to look more closely to the artistic purposes that Homer puts this curious device to for audiences of his own time, who were ignorant of our psychological jargon. That a god should put a thought into somebody's mind was as good and poetic an explanation of the mysteries of motivation as any. In a way, it still is. All we need to ask is that the thought be in keeping with the character of the person and with the circumstances. To this demand, Homer is always loyal. Close quote. And remember the conspicuous timing in which Homer supposedly lived, during the decades when the ancient Greek world was adapting a newer and more versatile alphabet for its writing system. A hypothesis shared in Caroline Alexander's introduction is that the new invention of writing helped flesh out the mythological archetypes of oral poetry into the remarkably deeper humans of written literature. But to be fair to the most popular work of epic Iron Age literature telling Bronze Age stories, much of the Hebrew Bible had already done this transition of preserving oral stories down into writing centuries before Homer. Yet somehow the biblical characters of the first five books, from Genesis to Deuteronomy, remain as far simpler speech bubbles. By comparison, the Greek world didn't have the same kind of ancient reverence for the unquestioned sanctity of written words that the ancient Hebrews did. Writing was newer to them and a more novel invention. Though it was relevant to how the Greeks understood their religion, the Iliad was not relevant to how they practiced it. The instructions the gods give here can be downright wrong, and the moral lessons our characters will learn are not exactly going to be the same thing as the founding text of a religious dogma. Greek poets were able to rewrite, re-edit, and flesh out and add new additions to the story as the years went on. So compared to his contemporaries... Compared to the relatively simple characters and the relatively simple one monotheistic god of the Bible, or compared to the polytheistic but still relatively simple version of the Greek god seen in Hesiod's Theogony, or compared to the relatively more simple folk adventure tales of Egypt, Homer blossoms those one-dimensional archetypes of ancient mythology into the three-dimensional depths of believable human characters. In Book 2, we learn that Nestor is not just a curmudgeonly old man who badmouths the youth. His criticism comes from a place of genuine compassion, and his decades of leadership experience are pulled up during these moments of rousing necessity. And likewise, Agamemnon is not just a stupid, proud, stubborn king who's only there to antagonize the progression of the plot. He actually does have a more inquisitive side that comes out in rare moments of submissiveness. But there's also the matter of how to interpret the glaring ableism and sexism in the Iliad, which I'll be getting into during our next chapter, with the introduction of Helen and Aphrodite and the idea of their God-given beauty, and how Thersites in Book 2 stands as a foil to those qualities, a maligned figure in Homer's time who would eventually have his glory in later history. Both matters of which relate to these grander questions around how the audience interpreted the place of their own humanity in this more chaotic world, with their more chaotic minds, that were so much more closely controlled by the gods. Book 2 ends with an infamously tedious section to read through, called The Catalogue of Ships, in which Homer meticulously lists out exactly how many soldiers are participating from exactly which regions of Greece under exactly which commanders. It's one of only a handful of cases in the poem where Homer evokes the muses to help jog his memory, and is regarded as a section that might have been a later addition by later poets to use as a quick reference guide for gussying up to and offering some extra flattery to whichever city or family was sponsoring the festival they were reciting the poem at. It's like an ancient version of a football game broadcasting what school or hometown each of the star players came from, to the delight of the alumni watching at home. People in Homer's audiences would have been keeping an ear out to hear their ancestors or their homelands called out in the catalog of ships. It's also one of the sections supporting the historicity of Homer setting this story in the Late Bronze Age. The catalog of ships mentions towns that had completely vanished from the historical record until the Mycenaean writing system was deciphered in the 1950s, when archaeologists found tablets mentioning places that were not mentioned anywhere else outside of Homer's catalog. 
The catalog of ships was employed to dictate official state policy over an ancient dispute when Athens and Megara were arguing over which city-state was entitled to control the island of Salamis. A Spartan arbitrator declared that, because the catalog of ships mentioned Salaminian soldiers sailing under Athenian ships, it belonged to Athens. Well, good enough for government work, I guess. Millennia later, after the advent of archaeology, the entire reason why we even refer to the Iliad's period of Greek history as the Mycenaean period is because the catalog of ships lists Mycenae as Agamemnon's home capital. It wasn't expected for each poet during each recital to repeat the entire catalog in full, so challenge accepted. I shortened it into little limericks inspired by Alexander Pope's iambic pentameter and took the opportunity to throw in some more exposition and backstory. It was really fun. Also, the artwork I used to associate for book two here is from an artifact called the Mycenaean Warrior Vase from 1200s BC, pretty close to the era of the Trojan War. And I think it's a great example of how just far off Mycenaean art is from what people usually associate with ancient Greek art. It is uncharacteristic with its focus on a group of fully armed warriors rather than a heroically naked single individual warrior, to say nothing of the anatomy going on. The style here looks more like a Hanna-Barbera cartoon from the 1970s than the chiseled buff musculature of even the Pelos combat agate. This is the imagery that shoots through my mind when I imagine exactly what kind of characters are lining up to be called out when Homer is going through the catalog of ships. And once again, I'd like to say thanks to Epidemic Sound for their library of music and sound effects. The musicians you heard in this episode were Gabriel Lewis, Wendell Scherer, and Ryan James Carr. I'd also like to acknowledge and give thanks to all the modern translators of Homer, from Robert Fagels to Richard Lattimore to Caroline Alexander to Peter Green. And I'd also like to give the biggest of thank yous to my Patreon supporters who made this project possible, which include Joel Jacobson, son of Jacob, Seb Eater, devourer of beer, Tom Webster of the many words, Joe Bags, who holds many things, Russell Callender of godlike punctuality, Ask Joe Batune, the most harmonious one. Zach Schuster, teller of tales. Marty Crinlin, friend of all healers. Quiddle Sticks, he who loves all animals. J.P.U., the most mysterious of deities. A. Cody Schufelin, who dances every day. Occluded Chungus, voracious consumer of carrots. Graham White, baker of crackers. Irwin Unate, lover of the spiced meat. Jason McClung of the Far-Flung Tongue, Jeffrey Paul, wise financier of funds, Pat Delaney, who is correct in all things, Michael Russell, fearsome at games of tennis, and finally, there was Emil Olberg of impeccable judgment. <laughs>